When I first got hurt, I felt like I was useless. I would ask, what am I supposed to do? What's, what's my mission here in life? I worry about my vets every day. Hi. America right now loves her veterans. And I worry that in 10, 20 years, we're going to forget. I am dumbfounded by how fast this organization has grown. This thing that we started from nothing start to actually make a real impact in people's lives. No one comes back from war unchanged. Some wounds are visible. For others, they are etched into our souls. You're never going to get past it. You just have to decide if you're strong enough to live with it. Two and a half million Americans have fought in Iraq and Afghanistan since 2001. You forget how different the world is over here. As a nation, we thank our veterans for their service. But few of us really know what war is like or how hard it is to return to a normal life after facing danger, suffering, and death. I want to change that. I want you to meet some people that I know and admire. Did you feel like you left healed? I left physically healed. My name is Wes Moore. I served in Afghanistan. I'm doing this project to preserve a moment in time. We're capturing photos, portraits of veterans as they share their stories of reentry to civilian life. There's no earthly reason why I should be alive. They represent a new generation of warriors. I look in the mirror and be mad at it. I want you to see them for who they really are, to know why it is that some struggle and many succeed. Four men gave their lives for me to do something with mine. Hearing and honoring what they have done and are doing. They have served our nation in battle, and they are rejoining the society they fought to defend. Funding for this program was provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Previously on Coming Back. I'm breathing. Can you need to talk? Yeah. Bobby's struggle with traumatic stress has separated him from his family. Family can be overwhelming for me. So I moved out. Taylor moves past his injury and has set his sights on playing college baseball. University of Tampa baseball, we've won a lot of titles, so it's highly competitive. I'm excited to go out and, uh, and compete against younger, uh, more athletic guys. This is veterans we build in America. This is real. Earl's connection to the veterans of Baltimore is based on a lie. Earl Johnson fabricated the majority of his military service. In this series, we have seen that for returning combat veterans, adjusting back to the civilian world can throw you off balance. We have seen that healing the wounds of war is difficult, both physically and mentally. But there is one thing that I have found that does stay the same. What drives us? We are people who are driven to be part of something big, something important. What we strive for is different in all of us, but we strive. Taylor Yarella's goal seems simple. He wants to make the baseball team. But Taylor's 10 years older than his competitors. And they've all got two legs. And one more thing. He chose the University of Tampa, the NCAA Division II National Champions. So exactly what's going on, man? Uh, I played baseball when I was younger and stuff, and I joined the Army, lost my leg, yada, yada, and I just always wanted to play college ball, trying to get back into it, trying to reteach myself some things. I want to start, relax up top. Turn on, turn, relax. That's it, good, that was it. That was boy right there. That's it, good, good. Ah, yeah. Do everything you're doing is right, but now you're just doing it a little bit too aggressive. So I need to tell myself, relax. Good. That's it. He works hard. He's in here for an hour, an hour and a half, two hours at some time. He's strong. He's real strong. So all he has to do is relax and trust that he can get through, you know, with his lower half just as well as anybody else. And he just trusts that, you know, his disability is not not as much of a disability as he's probably 
They usually have buckets. You don't have to pick them up one by one. I like buckets better. Take it easy, man. You were in Walter Reed for three years, right? Did you feel like you left healed? I left physically healed, yeah. Psychologically, I hadn't even scratched the surface. You know, I hadn't, I hadn't even thought about any of it. I wasn't set up well for transitioning out of the military. Not being able to relate with, with anybody in my surroundings um, and really started going through like separation, pain. It was just like an emptiness. And that's why I ended up into the, the mindset of, you know, okay, I have issues. Well, I'll just go out with my buddies and hang out and drink a little and have fun. And, you know, you feel a lot better, you know, for the time being. And it went from, okay, we're going out on the weekend and partying to, hey, it's Wednesday, it's Tuesday, you know, just really wanting to um, just shove all those emotions and all those feelings down and forget about them. Being around other guys that have been through it, that's when I really started to turn the corner. I started playing softball with other combat wounded uh, amputees and uh, I loved it. Being able to see the guys with amputations that were maybe a year ahead of me, seeing what they could do, that just drove me, man. Oh, epic fail. Hey, whenever you guys are good, just come in. It allowed me to heal both physically and, and mentally. Spoiler. hit you with a fat. <laughs> to the point where I could do tryouts. To be part of something bigger than yourself often means fighting through physical pain and emotional setbacks. But that's what warriors do. It is what makes us different. The last memories I have of Iraq was trying to fly my helicopter and trying to land it. And then I don't remember anything else after that. And so when I woke up in the hospital 11 days later, the doctors and nurses kept talking about a helicopter crash. And I thought I'd crash the aircraft. I blamed myself. And if my legs were gone, it was because I, had, I didn't do my job and I had crashed. Um, and that's when I went to the dark place. I thought that I'd failed as a pilot, I'd failed as an officer, I'd failed as a soldier. The worst thing that could ever happen to me was not losing the legs. The worst thing that could have ever happened to me was if I didn't do my job. And I did. And there's one picture taken of my helicopter on the ground after we'd landed. And she was beautiful, my bird sitting in that field in, in Iraq in that date rove. And there's this bird with a big old hole under my seat and a hole above my head. And she was on the ground, you know, so I knew that we'd landed the aircraft. I owe this life to the guys who saved me. And, and I don't ever want any of these guys to regret or to feel like that effort was wasted. I have to be more and I have to do more and I have to live up to that. And now that I'm in Congress, I really feel that it is my job to get out there into the American public and be a voice for my fellow vets. Yeah, the 13.7 million in improper payments. Yeah. The warrior ethos component of the Soldier's Creed is I will always place the mission first. I will never accept defeat. I will never quit. And I will never leave a fallen comrade. When I get too involved in politics and I get too uh, involved in Washington, D.C. craziness, that distills everything right back to where it is. Going up. Two hearings at the same time in two different buildings, it gets to be challenging. My next thing has already started, so you wait in line to answer your question. So as a freshman, I have to wait a while until it's my turn, and now, um, we got that done, now we have to run to the next thing. It's sort of my strategy when I'm in Washington to find common ground. And my overwhelming life experience that has really shaped who I am has been my time as a military officer. And so that is what I'm gonna to default to. 
The lessons I learned as an Army officer, the camaraderie I experienced are at the core of who I am, just as it is for my brothers and sisters in arms. I have really reached out to a lot of the veterans in the House because that's common ground for us. And, and if, you know, we, we, we start talk, telling our war stories and, and then we talk about, well, can, let's, let's co-sponsor something together. And I yield the balance of my time to the gentle lady from California who's been a leader in victims' rights, Ms. Spear. I thank the heroic lady from yes. Illinois. Gentlewoman's recognized. I have gotten such great feedback from people from both sides of the aisle who are willing to open the door and listen to me and who are willing to work with me. A lot of folks who said, you know, I don't agree with your, uh, with your political party, but you're really there for veterans and, and I, I want to work with you on this, so it's great. Capitol Hill to Baltimore's Oliver is an hour's drive and a world away. Earl Johnson's been working at the grassroots level to build a team of civic-minded veterans there. But the news that Earl fabricated his service record has shattered that team. Earl served one tour and then deserted. He ended up in jail. And after that, he couldn't get a job. I thought I was gonna be doing great things in his life and I can't even get a job flipping burgers. You know, so I remember filling an application and in that space, where I was struggling in jail, in that space where I was running from the Army, you know, I put still in Army. Dates. Extended the date on there. Maybe when I did that, you get the phone call back, you know? And I got a job. Do you understand why people were so disappointed, were so angered by this? Yeah, because they, they followed me on the premise that I was, I was this, this golden veteran that they can get behind. But they didn't come here, Earl, because you were the golden veteran. They came here because they trusted you. Right. And they felt like the trust was broken. Right. Can they trust you? You know, that's, that's an individual question. Um, the work I've done hasn't changed. All my friends that I work with for the last two years in Oliver were disappointed. And whether I'm even able to salvage my marriage or not, I don't know. We are literally taking it day by day. I cook dinner, and then because you stay here, I cook dinner for you too. Um, but I would do that for anybody. We are not living as a married couple. He stays in the basement, and I stay in my bedroom. Pearl will win by my trust if and that's the biggest question mark of them all. I want to believe them, but I, I, I just don't know. So why even lie about it? It just turned into something totally, totally different. Everybody thought, because of what I was doing here, that I was very special, you know? They listened to everything I said, and I just went along with it. He asked me this morning, are we ever going to get through this? I, I don't know. I don't know. The one thing I cannot stand is a liar. Utterly down to my soul. I, I just cannot stand it. And he just, he did it over and over again for six years straight as he laid beside me, unwavering. Earl's lies have damaged more than his marriage. He now needs to recover the trust his fellow vets placed in him and the sense of self-worth his mission provided. That could take a long time. Hey, really? Get down. It took Bobby Henline years. First, to recover from the stress of his injuries and medical treatment. Then, to find a new way to feel of service. When I first got hurt, I couldn't see me doing anything that I enjoyed. Again, you know, being able to help others. And I wouldn't be able to serve in the military. It really tore me up. I, I felt like I was useless. I would ask, what am I supposed to do? What's, what's my mission here in life? Yeah. For Bobby, taking his comedy on the road to troops who are still in the fight does help. We're gonna go out to Afghanistan, bring wounded warriors back that have been wounded there. I believe I'm the only one that's actually wounded in Iraq, but uh, these guys are going for closure. 
I'm definitely uh, going to do comedy out there for the troops. I love especially doing some of the military jokes out there with those guys and making them laugh, especially during the holidays, to go back and thank these guys and put a smile on their face. I, it's crazy, but I believe God put me here, kept me around to do comedy and speaking to help other people. I believe that was his mission that he saw, that he was giving me. Doing what I do helps me because I can still help others. I love helping others. It's another way to continue to serve. Making vets laugh is Bobby's way of giving back and staying connected to the community. But staying connected to his family is proving much harder. He and his wife, Connie, have been living apart for months. Remember, he jokes about how much I spend. Connie now spends more time connecting with friends. Does Bob damage stuff in the house? He used to in the beginning, not anymore. It got too expensive. In this group, dealing with a post-traumatic spouse is a frequent topic of conversation. So does he have any PTSD, men? Or does it come out in different, like, is he angry or mean? He, no, used, he used to be, he used to get really aggressive and be really short-tempered and stuff. Like, if Bobby's by himself, he does amazing, has absolutely no issues. But you put the kids into the mix, or you put me into the mix where I ask him to do something, he's like dealing with the kids sometimes. We can sit down on the couches. Let's go. Because I'm just going to keep eating if we sit in front of there. So, try to go. Okay, so you know he moved out, but I was always so worried about him really leaving. Now, I'm not sure, because sometimes it's more peaceful without him here. It's almost a relief to not be on eggshells. I mean, he freaks out about every little thing. That's why I was asking earlier all night, like if your husbands have PTSD, because I think his is really bad. I told him that he couldn't come back until he went to counseling. Why did you want him to go to counseling? What did you want it to accomplish? Well, I just want my old husband back, and now, You're like, I know. It's never going to be the way it was. It's got to be something new and different and grow from that. If you get the now, good right. therapist and you're both comfortable with the therapist, all this can come out. You'll hear it, you'll hear what he says, and you take it from there. You can only go one day at a time. One day at a time is both friend and foe to an athlete. Hey, y'all just gonna stand around and watch? Daily workouts have gotten Taylor Urella into the best shape he's been in since he was wounded. And watch solid contact. But is his aging body as resilient as his spirit? You know, I've been playing softball a couple times a week. I've been going to baseball training a couple times a week. So my body has no time to rest. Oh my God. You want to see this? It's a Bursa. I had quite a few setbacks with the tryouts. Not just the tryouts, but pretty much anything active. Walking, uh, there's been some trouble too. I see it's hitting like right there. That's what it's from. So it's, every time I run, it's just clipping down. <laughs> it's like stabbing in my knee every time I walk. It's real bad now. And it just keeps rubbing and rubbing and rubbing. I've been walking around with my cane, which I haven't used in about two years. You know where my leg is? <laughs> leg. No, it's not in there. It's not in there? Uh-uh. I don't have my foot and I don't have my calf, so my knee and my hip, my back have to do extra work. I am a little nervous that he's gonna be in tremendous amounts of pain. There's a lot of wear and tear on his leg, on his body. I mean, although he's just, he's missing his leg, that your whole body makes up for that. I mean, your back, your neck, your arms, everything. Oh. Oh. 
I'm popping like crazy today. Yeah, you are. <laughs> kind of funny. Yeah, if I didn't have this every day, I don't know what my body would do. <laughs> it's funny, I can feel it when I don't do it for a few days. It's like really? way tighter, yeah. Oh, probably about another minute or so I'm good on. Okay. Do you, yep, it's you just got it again. Last year, they thought I had a, uh, a bone infection and kind of warned me that a possibility of that could be that I would lose more leg. And that just kind of like, it crushed me. Yeah, yeah hi. How are you doing? Dr. Murphy. Doing? Good to meet you. Good to meet you. So tell me, what are the tryouts? So oh, September 6th. That was the bursa. The skin breakdown on the inside. How long have those been there? That one on the inside's been there uh, two months. A couple months? Yeah. Okay. It's just hard to heal because, you know, the constant friction every time I have my leg on. I'm sure it's nice and stable. Does, Does it? everything feel stable? Or yeah, I mean... For what happened to you, it's shocking to me that it's still holding up so strong. My main concern is getting those uh, skin right down to heal. Yeah. And I would be... Um, I don't think it's a bad idea to see a wound care specialist okay. you know, in town just to see, you know, see if they have any good ideas. Thank you so, very much. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. Thank you for your service to the country and your sacrifice. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And I appreciate you seeing me. Absolutely. Absolutely. Helps you a lot. Time. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. We'll see. <laughs> right. Did there ever come to a point when you start thinking to yourself, I could do some serious damage if I keep this up? I think that to myself every time I'm hurting the next day. Uh, and I will quit when it, when it gets real. Um, when it gets real? When it gets real, yeah. I can't express what it means to me to be able to play ball. It makes me feel normal again. And so, yeah, it's, it's worth everything. It really is. Feeling normal again is what Bobby Henline wants too. And nothing's more normal than teaching your teenage son to drive. It's also normally stressful for any parent. Break, 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 break. Oh, <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> scared me. And Bobby seems to be handling it, well, normally. I looked, there was no car, so I went. Yeah, but you turned you, it on. You, you turned it on, like you looked the same time you didn't blink her. So I'm just telling you to take your time. Skylar, do you want to pass the test? Skylar, Skylar, I'm trying to tell you. Take in your license, you gotta practice a certain way. Hey, when you pass your test, you could tell them. Go right. But you are doing you are doing good. You're doing well. I just point to those little things so that you realize that the instructor. I didn't even know they were bad clothes. I'm sorry. You're such a bad driver. Well, you need to pull over here next time. Oh, God. Driving with one teenager is enough. Don't have to hate. Three teenagers is way too much for me. Slowly but surely, Bobby is conquering his demons. In fact, he feels strong enough to tackle a new challenge. His daughter is on the dance pep squad at tonight's football game, and Bobby plans to be there, even though he knows that being in that big crowd could trigger a panic attack. I have to make my daughter's football game tonight. It's her first home game. The joy of getting dressed with one hand. I need to make sure that I'm there for my daughter and show my support. It's very important. Someone. Texans love their football, their high school football, as most of us know from Friday Night Lights. <laughs> and they like to get rowdy and have a good time. Be jumpy, I'll definitely be looking around. My daughter's on the field. If something happens there and the field gets rushed, you know, in, in my mind, I used to think, oh, that will never happen. But once you go through something like this and you've seen the worst of life, you know that anything can happen. So it makes you worry more. I worry, worry more about my family getting hurt. I got to go. Um, I got to face this game. Crowd. I gotta make sure they, they 
they see me showing that support. I don't know how long I can stay. <laughs> we'll see. See if I can see what can do. Too crowded. I gotta find a place to watch it because I tried to go in the crowd, but I can't watch it in the crowd. I, I walked up there and freaked out and I walked down, but so yeah, mom's up there in the middle somewhere. Sorry, go ahead. She's up there, but I walked up there and it was just too much in the middle of everybody. Wait, you want the red? This one's ugly. Mom, saw you, so she's coming after? Yeah, around halfway. I texted her. Too many people moving around behind me. Can you see her at all? She's still sitting there? I'm watching my hair. I just wanted to say hi to you. I can't go up. There's too much. Well, yeah, but I want to rub the girls. I don't want. I don't care about. You can see from here too. And I wanted to talk to you. Please come say hi to me. No, and I'll probably go after halftime. After halftime, this is a good game. It's a good game, but like just the seating was. That's her scream. She was the first one to scream. And little Christina. Yeah, those two scream all the time. Ridiculous. Don't you do that to her. Are you leaving? Yeah. You are? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to stay and watch the game. I know. Bye. 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 You know that, Mom? I'm going to head out. You just kind of learn. There's gonna be some things that you just can't do with your dad anymore, but the, the important part is that we do have my dad. The rest of the hen lines are tired of his baby steps, but for Bobby, making it to halftime is a big achievement. One of the things I admire about guys like Bobby is that as frustrating as slow progress can be, they just keep at it. Persistence and tenacity two qualities that Tammy Duckworth brought from Iraq to Capitol Hill. Now, what do you suppose a wounded combat veteran hates more than a liar who poses as a wounded combat veteran? Not much. This is what happens when a guy exploiting a phony injury to get veterans benefits faces Congresswoman Tammy Duckworth. Gentle lady from Illinois, Miss uh, Duckworth, please. Thank you. Mr. Castillo, how are you? Thank you. Thank you for being here today. I, I am not well, but you're welcome. All right. So, your foot hurt? Your left foot? Uh, yes, ma'am. It hurts. Yeah, my feet hurt too. In fact, mm, the balls of my feet burn continuously, and, and I feel like there's a nail being hammered into my right heel right now. So I can understand pain and suffering and, and how service connection can actually cause long-term, unremitting, unyielding, unstoppable pain. Um, so I'm, I'm sorry that twisting your ankle in high school has now come back to, to hurt you in um, such a painful way, if also opportune for you to gain the status for your business as you were trying to compete for contracts. Shame on you, Mr. Castillo. Shame on you. You may not have broken any laws, but you certainly broke the trust of this great nation. You broke the trust of veterans. Well, let me tell you something. I recovered with a young man, a Navy corpsman, who, while he was running into an ambush where the, his Marines were hurt, had his leg knocked off with an RPG. He put a tourniquet on himself and crawled forward. Twisting your ankle in prep school is not defending or serving this nation, Mr. Castillo. 
Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry, I've gone, you've been very indulgent. I yield back. Uh, I thank the gentlelady and the time was well spent. <laughs> not very professional of me. I lost my temper in, in committee, yeah. I did not appreciate, um, you know, what he was doing because there are so many legitimate veterans out there who are waiting a long time for care that, that they can't get access to because the, the system is so clogged with folks like Mr. Castillo. Earl Johnson was looking to change the world, and he was starting with a rough neighborhood in Baltimore. As it happens, that's my hometown. I've seen the work that Earl is doing every single day, and I admire it. I don't admire his dishonesty, but I understand it. Not every veteran or every person, for that matter, has a flawless past. Earl concealed his past, hoping that his good work would redeem him. He didn't stop working in Oliver, but he knew he had a huge obstacle to overcome if he wanted to stay. After all this mess came out, you know, I took a few days just to curl up and disappear for a while. It's right around the time that I do my, my typical, I do my patrols around the neighborhood. And I heard seven or eight shots. And I just knew what it was. Guy got shot like complete execution in the middle of the day. You know, and I, and I knew right then and there I could no longer, you know, sit around, feel sorry for myself because we couldn't lose Oliver. We've done so much. And I'm out crying and pouting about, you know, stuff that happened 11 years ago. I printed out about 200 letters, and I walked around, and I passed them out. You know, this letter that I wrote was to tell the truth to everybody, and I wanted people to know, you know, the person they saw cleaning up the street, the person they saw, you know, talking with the police, the person they saw doing things that they considered good things. It wasn't necessarily a well-rounded, squared-away person. I was no different than anybody else. And, um, the first sentence starts off with, you know, hello, my name is Earl, and I live in the Oliver community. And, and over the past years, I've worked hard to stem the violence, blight, and drugs in the community. Um, during that time, I've, I was hiding the missteps of my youth. I struggled for many years um, trying to redeem myself, and um, this is who I am. If what we've seen is that at least a portion of this story that there's nothing there, that there is no fact there. How are we supposed to trust you? How are they supposed to listen to you now and, and say to themselves, okay, but I believe he's telling me the truth now? I would wanna say is that I'm not asking them to um, believe or trust. What I'm asking them is to understand that there's a great human need in Oliver. I'm there. I'm doing the work. I will ask for you to look at what I've done now and measure it with my past and say if there's any worth there. Earl knows he may never earn back the full trust of the community. Instead, he's asking to be judged solely on what he's accomplished here and the work he continues to do. It's tryout day in Tampa. Taliarella is also about to be judged. He's hoping that his months of training will pay off.
you guys be just take a seat facing me so I can explain everything. Okay, I'd like to uh, welcome all of you guys to our tryout. Um, Taylor served our country and I think he deserves a round of applause. Thank you. Like you guys, he has a, uh, a lifelong dream of uh, making a college baseball team. Come on, guys. I'm gonna get up and clap too. Good job, man. Good job. Thank you, guys. This is one of the best baseball programs in the country, period. I don't care what division. So it will be tough. It's going to move quick. Tough to finish the throws a little bit. Mm -hmm. I know you really want a true evaluation of where you're at for this level of baseball uh, right now. Delay that creates a little bit of, of a issue out there. Ah, come on, come on. It's not you, man. Wow. You know, right now, you were well below average for what we would be looking for. Sucks, but it is what it is, man. Be back next year. It's really tough for us to sit here and not fulfill a dream that you've had for a long time. And even if it was just one college at bat that you got, you've earned this and you can't feel like you have it. You know, and if we can do it for you, we want to do it for you. My dream was to play ball, be a part of a team, uh, be in the dugout with the guys every game. It wasn't to, you know, to get one at bat. So uh, as much as I appreciate that, you know, that's, that would be obviously awesome. But, but I definitely want to do it the right way. I want to earn my spot on the team. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it, Coach. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All. you. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Making the team would have been great. It's something I really worked hard for, and I wish it would have happened, but I just expected, you know, different results. I didn't expect to make it, but uh, I just, I don't know. It's below average in every category. Below average, the words kind of sting, so made it difficult. A few years back, you're laying still in Iraq, just having survived, barely living. A few years later, you're now trying out for one of the best baseball teams in America. What do you think about when you think about how far you have come in such a short period of time? Unfortunately, I don't think about that. Uh, you know, I, hearing it from you, it, it does, you know, I, I kind of have to hear it from people, you know, and it, it, that, it means a lot to me, but I've never thought about it like that before. You know, I, um, I don't know, I guess it's, it's pretty cool. It's great. I just I have such high expectations of myself that I can't just look at it like that, you know. It's still, I'm extremely happy every day of my life that I'm even able to run, you know. I went five hours a day in physical therapy, you know, for three years. I did it so I could be out there on the field, so I could feel normal, you know, so I could play better than that guy with two legs, you know. It's, that's, why I, that's why I do it. Connie Henline is hoping she and Bobby can get closer to normal, too. She told him that between his traumatic stress and her irritation with his behavior, she couldn't see how they could get things back on track. Not without therapy. Nice to meet you. I'm Connie. Hi. Hi. Nice Bobby. to meet you. How are you doing? I'd just like to hear from you when it's, we did it. It's where you want to be. What you wishing for? No, I wish that we can, um, work on stuff, communicate better without fighting. Okay. I mean, I'd like to feel appreciated okay. when we're done okay. for the things that I do. We've been going to therapy now a little over a month. I think it's made a tremendous difference. I feel much better. It's going pretty good. Therapy's, 
therapy I think it is helping where but I won't, we won't learning to communicate better, which sounds crazy when you're 42 years old and been married almost 20 years, you think you would know how to talk to each other. <laughs> Did you like him? Yeah. We were 21 when we met. Connie and I's birthday are a day apart. She's actually eight hours older than me. So we're going to celebrate our birthdays together with the family and everything. And with everything going on with the marriage, and just kind of focus on more of uh, trying to be a family and, and having fun with our friends and family. Celebrate. I think you should see this because if one pops, we might have an episode. <laughs> oh, God. Hey, guys. Oh, wow. If you hear a pop, don't think that you're back in Iraq because you're just at our house. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the warning. Just don't be pop in the balloons. Pop, don't freak out. Because I'll probably scream. My dad's going to be like, oh my god, what's going on? <laughs> yeah, your scream will probably scare me more than the balloons. Exactly. One thing I learned in therapy is that um, PTSD isn't something that we can just expect him to deal with. We're going to all have to adjust our lives a little bit more just to learn how to help him through that. Right now, it's looking really good of us staying together. Definitely, we still need a, a lot of counseling to go. Um, I might need some individual counseling, <laughs> um, just for myself. Oh. Yeah. Happy birthday. <laughs> Happy birthday. That's cute. Too much. <laughs> Too much already? Yeah, everybody came at me right away. <laughs> Do you need, you need some medicine? Can't, that's fine, but Keaton and Lexi were both I know, they're just I know, I know, I know, but you know me, I just can't have that when I first walk in. Look what she did, she blew up our picture. Oh, cool. And then everyone He's here more than he is gone, so I guess it's waiting to figure out um, if he's ready, if I'm ready, you know, and then discussing that with the kids. I'm optimistic that we can work it out and that he'll move back into the house with all of us. I want to ask you a question. What is the difference between this guy and this guy? The other guy was broken. He was confused at that point. This guy knows for sure where he is now. This guy is on a path to fulfill for everybody, to help others, to still serve. The other guy didn't think he could serve. That was the deep, dark days. This is the guy I'm very happy to be. Bobby Henline's last six years have been a long road. His mental and physical recovery are still a work in progress and it may always be. We know that now, but it's important that we keep people like Bobby in our minds. His need to heal could continue on for years. The needs of our vets are real, but so are their achievements. Many of them have assumed leadership roles and more will follow. As they move into the next chapters of their lives, their impact on the life of the nation will be felt. My guys motivate me. On the days when, when my body hurts and I don't want to get out of bed, I get out of bed because it's not about me anymore. Each one of us should be aware of the fact that there are veterans among us and that there are things we can do to be helpful and to be on the lookout. Oh, so just stay right yeah, here while yeah. people talk? Yeah. Oh, okay, okay, great. Yeah, yeah, so we can do a one-on-one -on -one yeah, conversation. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Hi, a merchant marine. Oh, oh my goodness, and a kiss. I've been known as a kisser. You've been known as a kisser. This is me. Look at you, you're such a baby. Yeah. You were 15 when you joined the merchant marines? Yes. Oh my goodness. Did they know you were 15 or did you lie about your age? My, father, my dad did the same thing in World War II. Oh, that's funny. Your Thank health you. is good? My health is good. You're getting all your benefits? Yes. Social Security, VA, the whole, the whole all that good stuff? Right. Good. Well, I'm glad that you're getting the benefits that you deserve. I worry about my vets every day. America right now loves her veterans. And I worry that, you know, in 10, 20 years, we're going to forget. And, and yet, these vets right now from Iraq and Afghanistan are going to be 40 years old. Will the money be there? Will the American people be there? Or will they have forgotten and thought, oh, that was 20 years ago? And if you look at the Vietnam veterans' experience or Gulf War veterans' experience, that you will see that. I have no, no problems with that physical and stuff. Mm -hmm. 
just my venti. They've been running me around for five yeah. years now, and I'm still with a temporary on top. Oh, for well, five to... years? Where do you go? Do you go to Heinz? Heinz, That's yes. where I go. We have the lady who's in charge of Heinz here today. Is, uh, she is? is Joan? Hey, Joan. Hi. I have one of your patients. He goes to Heinz. He says he gets wonderful care with everything, but he has a little issue with dental. Is there someone that could help him? Uh, Maybe I, talk with we'll them? Just take your information and get back to you. You know, the eligibility rules have so Maybe Oh, he's 100%. Oh, no. He's a 100% guy. Yeah, yeah. He, he's been working with Heinz for five years. Oh, I appreciate you. That's Thank you for Heinz. serving. Boy, did you serve. Thank you. I, feel so I will good. follow up. You're a great lady. Thank you. Thank you. Thank with you. less than one half of 1%, of Americans serving in uniform today. Uh, more and more so, Americans have been disconnected from the military experience. Good to see you. And, and there's just no understanding of what that's like. That's not an excuse to not be willing to help. We all have a stake in this. I always, you know, I always say, you know, when America, um, when our nation asks, who's willing to go serve and who's willing to go die for this country. Our military men and women said, I'm willing to do that. And they didn't wait. So when our military men and women come home and our veterans come home and they're asking for help from America, why do we make them wait? Disabled veterans do need medical care. They need help reintegrating back into society. But once they are up, you'd be amazed at how far they can go. Haley Arella has found himself a new sport, a new mission. There you go. I've actually grown yeah. kind of more of a, uh, a love for softball than I thought I would. He and another warrior founded Vet Sports. I started Vet Sports the summer before last. Okay. The main way people are rehabilitating or, or recovering from, from things they're going through from previous wars, and this one too, it's kind of the go-to, you know, drugs and alcohol. Yo, Roberto. Vet sports is, is, is anti that. We don't want to be smoking cigarettes and drinking beer. We want to be playing sports. Socializing, connecting with other veterans, being inspired by those veterans, and reintegrating back into the community. I think a lot of guys, you know, they, they resort to sulking on the couch and, and thinking about the old days. All right, let's do it. I'm heading out. And now they're playing softball every week, you know, and it starts small and, and builds from there. dumbfounded by how fast this organization has grown. They now have six chapters across the United States. In the past week and a half, I've been in three different states. New York for the All-Star Game, back home for a day, went to Houston for four days, and here I am. Thank you, guys. This thing that we started from nothing start to actually make a real impact in people's lives. This past weekend was really awesome for me because I had a lot of people tell me what it meant to them to see me out there doing what I do. I really want to get to be the best softball player I can be. There's one more person I'd like for you to meet. Just bring your right hand up over here, okay? Her name is Stacy Pearsall. Bring your forehead this way just a little bit. She's the photographer who's taken many of the portraits of the veterans that you've seen in our programs. If we were standing in conversation, would you have a hand in your pocket, a hand on your hip, arms crossed like this? Like that. Okay. Am I just a photographer? Probably. But as a veteran, I'm a comrade and a, a sister to, to each and every person who I sit across from. Stacy learned photography in the Air Force. The job of a war photographer demands that you get as close as you can to the action. Twice, that put her in the blast zone of an IED. A series of injuries ended her military career. 
The doctors told Stacy she'd never be able to pick up a camera again. Um, tell me a little bit about your Air Force history. But if you're looking for a surefire way to be wrong, tell a veteran there's something they can't do. In Normandy, it was pretty bad where we were at. She started off just taking pictures of other patients in the VA hospital. Stacy now travels the country taking portraits of American warriors. I remember telling him that I think we're going to die here. Well, what I found was it was a two-way exchange. So while I was feeling validated and empowered by the veterans I was photographing and talking to, they were feeling the same way. You really thought about it when you see one of your buddies dead. Yeah. Right, you know that. Uh, yeah, I do know that. So what started as a way for me to start the healing process within myself really became a way for me to help others in theirs. And so I think in a way we're lifting each other up, which is, again, that sort of very military camaraderie foundation. So what do we have here? They're a collection of veterans from every generation and every branch of service. Some are able-bodied and some are disabled. This is kind of trying to wash away what we think today's veteran looks like. Wow. Look at his expression. It isn't just about the portrait, but it's a chance for them to be recognized. Yes. That's exactly it. It's my chance to honor them and having so many other people see them as who they are and for the sacrifices they've made. And what about you? How do you, how do you want for your legacy to be remembered? I don't know. As a proud American veteran, that's how I'd want to be remembered. <laughs> I wanted you to meet this gallery of veterans, not because their stories are unique, but because they're so typical. When you think about all the things that you've done, all the jobs that you've had, which job, which title are you the most proud of? Being a soldier. Being a soldier. Knowing who our veterans are is a beginning. The next step, is making sure we don't forget them. I want them to realize that when the war's over, it's not over for us. You know, we're still going through stuff every single day. We need their support, you know, five years from now, just like we do today. I was in the Army an inch of time. And the skills I learned, I applied in dealing with my neighbors. I applied in dealing with the police. I applied in dealing with the city. And to my surprise, got results. Imagine what tens of thousands of veterans can do for a state. It is an untapped resource. I was taught young, you know, we owe a debt, each of us, for the countless millions who have come before us, served, given their time, given their lives, to ensure that we have the lives that we do today. I think that. That was what's important, is that I, I made the effort to repay that debt. And um, it was my pleasure to serve. We are and we will always be the parents and the siblings, the leaders and the workers, the ordinary and the extraordinary members of our American communities.